Deborah lay in bed, thinking. It was two hours now since she and Claude, with the rest of the frightened court, had received a sharp command from the ushers to depart instantly to their various apartments, in the palace or out of it. That the ushers' voices were the echo of the king's was beyond doubt, and that fact was reason sufficient for the prompt obedience given to the bidding. Thus Deborah, like every other witness of the evening sensation, had retired, to lie wide awake, and go, over and over again, through the little chain of incidents which had passed before her eyes. Her meditations were more involuntary, less purposive, than most, however. The sight of a human being in great suffering had roused in her that keen instinct which had lain nearly dormant now for so many months. After the fall, she had been one of the first to reach the side of Claude's cousin. She recalled the press of fluttering women and excited men. The king himself had been obliged to force his way to her. The queen, supported on either side by Madame de Boufflers and de Luynes, remained in her chair, making frightened, unanswered inquiries as to the duchess' state. And through it all Madame had lain prostrate, writhing and shuddering, in her long velvet robes. It was finally Mirepoix, with Darginson, white-lipped, Moripa, very stern and still, and Marshal Coigny, who, at a sign from their sovereign, lifted the woman from the floor and carried her away from the eager, gaping throng to her own rooms. The king, having dispatched two messengers, one for Falconet, the other for Canet, and having left the whispered command with the ushers, himself departed after La Chateauroux, taking with him his usual companion in all things, Richelieu. Hereupon followed the dispersal of the court, and here, later, was where the recollections and meditations of the common courtiers ended, and only a fresh beginning could be made and gone through, for future gossip and reference. It was different with Deborah. Her heated brain had reflected the whole kaleidoscopic picture in a flash, as a single impression, again, and once again. But it was not upon small incidents, the acts or words of others, that her later imagination halted. Instead, she was reviewing, moan by moan, shudder by shudder, wild look and desperate closing of the eyes, the strange illness that had so suddenly seized the woman Claude had loved. That guttural cry, as if the throat had contracted suddenly, the fever flush, visible to a keen gaze beneath the rouge, the growing dullness of the eyes that contradicted the theory of natural fever, the incessant, useless retching, the paroxysms that had wrung a groan of pity from Lewis himself, all these, incomprehensible to those about her, Deborah had noted. And she found two things, two little points, which seemed to convey, as out of some past, a shred of memory, a suggestion that she had been witness of another such struggle, somewhere, at some time. The first fact was that La Chateauru, as the pain, after a second cessation, reattacked her with new fury, suddenly threw up her arms and clutched, with stiffening fingers, at the air. Secondly, just after this, a bright sweat broke out upon her forehead, and, as a great drop rolled down her face, Deborah saw the body quiver as if with cold. Such things, where had she seen them before? Who was it that had passed through her life undergoing such experience? No shadow of grief clung about the memory. No. There had been no death, then. Who had been with her? Carol. Sambo. The Ammonita muscaria pitted against the Atropa belladonna. It had all come back now. She had seen the symptoms of poisoning by the deadly fungus again, here, in this France. She, even here, possessed the means of saving life again, perhaps, if, if, if there was only time. Simultaneously with that last thought Deborah leaped out of bed, and, holding up her long white gown, ran swiftly through her quiet boudoir and into the salon, which was, as usual, faintly lighted with a night lantern. Seizing this from the table where it stood, she opened its door, snuffed the candle within to greater brilliancy, and carried it over to the mantelpiece, where she set it down. An instant more and the cabinet was open before her. Inside, in their even rows, stood her bottles of liquids, and near them, near them, the box of Ammonita muscaria. Deborah's eyes fell instantly upon this object. Strangely enough, the thought had not heretofore struck her that she possessed some of these things. The blood around her heart suddenly grew cold. Who was it that had seen them not three days ago? Who was it that had stood beside her here, had taken that box down from its place, 
and asked her about its contents. How much had she told him about them? Had, could he know? Suspicion was carrying her too far. The thing was preposterous, impossible. Nevertheless, with a hand that shook and fingers numb with cold, she took down the white box. In it there had been ten of the things. Now she must look. Could she? Her eyes, that should have sought the box, were raised for a moment. She saw that the room was lighter. Behind her another candle burned. She faced about. Then, seeing someone in the doorway, Deborah's overwrought nerves gave way, she shuddered convulsively, dropped the box and its contents to the floor, put both hands pitifully out towards the figure, and swayed where she stood. Claude sprang forward, and caught her just in time. For a moment or two she leaned heavily upon him. Placing his light upon the mantel near the lantern, and taking her in both arms, he carried her over to a small sofa near the dark window. There, smoothing the tangled, half-powdered curls back from her face and neck, and taking both the cold hands in his to chafe warmth back to them again, he asked, gently. What is it, Deborah? What is the matter? What were you doing here? The figure in his arms trembled and stiffened. Deborah sat up, and then rose to her feet. Drawing one hand away from his, she put it over her eyes. Claude, she said, in a low voice, pick up for me those, those things on the floor and put them into the box. Hunt well, don't let any of them escape you. Then to tell me how many there are. Claude wondered, looked at her intently for a moment, and finally obeyed her without a word. He picked up the small black objects that lay about the box, searching the floor carefully to get them all, and counting them as he replaced them, with a kind of interest. Look well, she repeated. As you believe in God, do not miss a single one. They are all here. How many? Six. Silence followed that word, and Claude, watching his wife, could not see that a muscle in her body moved. Nevertheless, he dared not break the stillness. When she spoke at last, it was in a normal tone. Claude, we must go to the palace at once. Child, you are mad. What do you mean? Claude, you must trust me. I know the sickness of your cousin. I can perhaps save her life. Come with me now, at once. No. Claude, for the sake of mercy, you must come. Claude de Maley sent towards his wife a glance that cut her like a knife. What do you know? he asked. Everything. Tell me. No, I cannot do that. You must wait. Madame de Chateauroux has been poisoned. I know how by whom, but not why. By making me wait, you are killing her. Claude, you love her. I will save her life for you. Do you hear? I will save the woman you love. Come. Claude looked about him feverishly. I love her, he muttered. Then aloud he asked, who was it that tried to kill her? Claude. Claude. Be still. Come with me. Claude de Maley strode over to his wife's side and grasped one of her wrists so tightly that she bit her lips with pain. Answer me. Who was it? What do you know? Deborah cast at him a look which had in it a kind of despair, but which held neither fear nor dread. You will be her murderer if you delay longer. Claude, the coma will come. We shall be helpless then. Let me go, I am going to the palace. Claude released her and stepped back. 
Something in the expression of her clear eyes had brought him boundless relief. There was no guilt in her face, none in her manner. Dress yourself. I will go, he said, sharply, and then, after seeing her fly away towards her room, he retreated to his own, to don heavy cloak, hat, and rapier, for he had not yet undressed for the night. When, after some moments, he returned to the salon, his wife, in her heavy police and hood, with muff under her arm, was standing in front of the still open cabinet, looking at the bottles within. At last, from among them, she took one that was half filled with clear liquid. Fixing its cork in tightly, she slipped the flask into her muff and turned to Claude. I am ready now. How long you were, she said. They passed together out of their rooms, through the dark passage, and down the stairs. It was scarcely yet midnight. The front doors of the house were still unlocked, and the concierge was just reflecting on bed. How shall we go, whispered Deborah, as they stepped into the frozen night. It may be possible to find a coach. Otherwise, we must walk. They had gone but twenty yards up the street when, luckily enough, an empty vehicle, which had just left a party of roistering nobles at a gambling house, came rattling towards them. Claude called out to the driver, who stopped on hearing his voice. A Louis Dior if you get us to the palace in ten minutes, cried young de Maley. The coachman opened his eyes. We shall do it in seven, Monsignor, he said, eagerly. Claude opened the door and Deborah sprang in before him. There was a snap of the whip, a plunge of the horses, and for something like the time designated they fairly flew through the darkness, from the Rue Royale to the Avenue de Sos, and down St. Michi to the Boulevard de la Reine. When they finally crossed the Second Avenue St. Antoine, Claude drew a deep breath. We are nearly there, he said. In another moment they had drawn up before the grand entrance on the court of ministers. If Claude had been wise, he would have entered the palace by the chapel, and so avoided the guards. But this adventure was not of his planning. Deborah's desires he could only conjecture, for she had not spoken during the drive. Therefore, tossing the coachman his golden coin, he helped his wife from the coach, and with her entered the great vestibule, which was filled with Suisses and extra king's guards. These saluted respectfully enough as the couple entered the doorway, but, when Claude proceeded towards the staircase, a musketeer barred his way. Your order, monsieur, he said, respectfully. My order? I have none. It is not permitted to pass without, tonight. His Majesty's commands, monsieur, said the man. Claude turned to his wife. You hear, he said. For answer, Deborah herself turned towards the soldier. We may wait here, in the vestibule, she asked. Certainly, madam, answered the guard, at once moving out of the way. Claude and Deborah turned reluctantly and walked towards the other side of the great vestibule. As they went Claude accosted another member of the royal guard. My good man, I am a cousin of Madame de Chateauru. We come on a matter of the greatest importance. Will you not permit us to ascend? The man stared at them keenly, with a kind of smile. Madame de Chateauru is not in the palace, said he. Deborah looked aghast. Not in the palace, she murmured. S.H. It is the usual method. It means nothing. She is here. Listen, Deborah, I am going to ask Mitchett, yonder, whom I know very well, if you may retire to the little chamber a manteau to wait. From there we can get into a passage which will take us to the little staircase. Remain here for a moment. Deborah watched him go towards a Suisse, who addressed him by title as he approached. 
She perceived that he thrust something into the man's hand, and, when he returned to her side, it was with relief in his face. That was better, he whispered. Come now, here. He drew her hurriedly into a narrow room off the vestibule, and from there, three minutes later, through a small, paneled door that led into the south wing of the palace. Here they were safely beyond the provinces of guards, and, after passing through a long series of dimly lighted rooms, they came presently upon a small staircase just off what is now the Corps de la Surintendance. Up one flight of these, through two deserted rooms and a short hallway at the end of the king's state apartments, and they halted before a tapestry door. This is her antechamber, said Claude. Deborah put out her hand and pushed it open. They entered. The room was brightly lighted, but empty. The boudoir muttered dimly. He hurried across the room to another door, Deborah close at his heels. It was he who opened this. As they crossed the threshold of the Persian hung room they faced two people, a man and a woman Antoinette Crescott and his grace de Richelieu. Madam! Claude had never heard so strange an intonation from his friend's lips. He saw his wife start nervously and stand perfectly still, while the king's gentleman took two or three steps backward towards the door which led into the bedroom. Silence followed the exclamation. Antoinette, the maid, astonished at this appearance of the young man whom she had once known so well, together with a companion, a woman, whom she had never seen, dared not, by reason of her place, voice curiosity. She whom Richelieu had addressed simply as Madame remained as if petrified, her large grayish eyes burning into Richelieu's, her face colorless, her expression inscrutable. And the Duke's eyes shifted, a thing that no one had ever seen before shifted from Deborah's feet to her face, from her to Claude, and then stared away at nothing, while his white hands were clenched and his graceful body stiffened. Finally, after uncomfortable minutes, Claude lifted his hand and pointed. Marie and is there, he asked. Richelieu drew back yet more closely against the door. No one is permitted to enter, he said, in a low, dogged voice. His tone seemed to break the spell under which Deborah had been standing. I will enter, she said, moving swiftly towards him. Duplessis did not stir. Let me pass, she whispered. By what right, madam? Have you His Majesty's order? Let me pass, she repeated, lower than before. Why? For answer she looked straight into his eyes, but he, though every muscle in his body quivered, steadily held his own. Then she said, rapidly, I can save her life if only there is time. Thereupon, a little more stubbornly, a little more relentlessly, he shrank against the door. Deborah drew a sharp breath, and suddenly seized both his large white wrists with her own hands. For an instant, by reason of the suddenness of her move, it seemed as though he must yield. With an effort he regained his equilibrium, and then all the strength which desperation might have put into her could not have moved him one inch. Deborah, what are you doing? came Claude's clear, sharp voice. Claude, help me, I must pass that door. I must, I will pass the door. Help me. Claude gazed at his wife as though she had gone demented, and Antoinette, also astounded, stepped forward. Pardon, madame, but his majesty is in that room, together with the doctors, madame de Flavicourt, and Père Segond. Monsieur le Duc had orders to allow none to pass tonight. This explanation had apparently no effect upon madame de Maly. For a bare instant she turned to look at the girl, and then shook her head impatiently. I tell you I can save the life of Madame de Chateauru. I am the only person who can do so, for only I. Suddenly she stopped. The door opened from the inside. Richelieu straightened himself and stepped forward, as out of the bedroom came a man, 
tall and stoutish, in square wig and loose black suit which made him appear old. This was Ken A. Closing the door behind him, he stood looking in some astonishment at the newcomers. Presently recognizing Claude, however, he bowed slightly. Claude returned the salute, and no one stirred as the doctor crossed the room and flung himself upon a chair with the manner of one who has made up his mind on an important point. It was Richelieu who, after a doubtful glance at Deborah, asked, gently, she is worse?